I had kind of a, uh, a little bit of trouble um, uh, with this, with knowing what to preach you this morning. Uh, when I sat down to really start thinking about what it was going to be, I uh, this I, someone had just recently given me a book. It was Pink's book on Elijah, and it caught my eye. And usually, when something catches my eye, it's the Lord's way of saying, "Let me look at that a little bit deeper." Amen. And so I got it, and I started looking at it. I'm like, okay, so what am I do? So I turned to Kings and. I was looking at Elijah, and I was like, okay, I got, had a pretty good idea of what I was going to do. I went and started to write it, and it stuff quit coming to me. I was like, man, this ain't it. I don't know. I was like, maybe I'm just going about it the wrong way. And so I just kind of switched my perspective, I guess, a little bit. I was like, you know, and I went down that road a little bit, and it quit coming to me. I said, no, this isn't it either. And I tried two or three different ways to make Elijah work, and I couldn't make Elijah work. <laughs> and so uh, then I was like, well... Okay, I feel like it's in the Old Testament though, so I was, you know, just kind of looking, and I was like Malachi. Flipped to Malachi chapter two there, and I was like, this is it. I got a good idea of what I'm gonna do with this, and so I changed, you know, my outline again, and I started reading it and thinking about it, and I was like, no, this isn't it. And then the, the Lord brought this message uh, to my mind, and I was like, the Lord, I've already preached that, <laughs> and the Lord said, well, they ain't heard it yet, uh, so. If you've heard this one, I'm sorry, but it's, I believe it's what the Lord had for me and, and for y'all this morning. But um, Ezekiel chapter 22, uh, in verse 30, the Bible says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge Amen. and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them, and have consumed them. With the fire of my wrath of their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Amen. Go with me in prayer if you will. Dear Lord, we come before you asking for your help, dear Lord, and uh, for your guidance, dear Lord, that you would use me, dear Lord, and that the words that I would speak would be for you, dear Lord. And the Lord asks you to help me in that, and the Lord asks you to help and uh, prepare the hearts and the minds of those that receive it, dear Lord, so that they might be able to take it and use it for you, dear Lord, not because of me. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So what is standing in the gap? Standing in the gap is someone that would say, Lord, don't, don't destroy this people just yet. Mm-hmm. In our time, I think we say, Lord, don't come back just yet. Lord, hold on. There's still some people out there that haven't been saved. And it says here in Ezekiel's time, it says, I, the Lord sought for a man among them that they should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But the Lord found none. Can we say that we are standing in the gap? Mm. When we back that up further, do we know that there's a gap in the hedge? Because mm. you can't fix a problem unless you know that there is one. So I guess the question, the first question is, do you think that there's a gap in the hedge? And the second question is, if there is one, are you willing to stand in it? Yeah. I believe that anyone can stand in the gap. Amen. Doesn't just have to be a man. Right. Doesn't just have to be a preacher. Doesn't just have to be somebody who went to theology school. Anybody can stand in the gap because you can talk to the Lord. Amen. And you can pray. You don't have to be something special. You can just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, hold on just a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Lord, I'm just I'm working on this guy. Lord, I, I, I'm not, but I'm talking to this guy and I'm witnessing to this guy. And dear Lord, they're not saved yet. And dear Lord, I just ask you to wait just a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are we willing to be used by the Lord? Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel. First <clears throat> Samuel, chapter 3. First Samuel, chapter 3, and verse 10. The Bible says, The Lord came and stood and called us at other times. Samuel, Samuel, then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Amen. Now we all know the story is associated, I hate the story, the account associated with this uh, with this right here is the Samuel was in the temple and the Lord came and said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. 
And Eli said, I didn't call you to go back to bed. And so Samuel went, went back to bed, and then the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli and said, hey, what do you need? And Samuel, Eli said, don't worry about it. Go, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And he said, but I tell you what, next time it happens, you say, hey, Lord, here am I. Amen. And this time, Samuel said, Lord, here am I. And the Lord used Samuel in a great mighty way, didn't he? But you know what? He never would have if Samuel hadn't said, Lord, speak for Amen. thy servant here. So the Lord is calling us, are we saying, who called me? Mm -hmm. Are we wondering who is who needs us? And whenever we know, we just need to say, Lord, speak to me. Mm -hmm. Lord, use me. Are we willing to be able to say, Lord, I, I'm ready. Lord, I want to be used. Lord, I want to stand in the gap. Or are we like Samuel before he knew, he, he just weren't around trying to find out what we can do for the world, right? Well, there's a problem. Let's science our way out of this one, right? Mm -hmm. People, I, I was talking with one of the guys at church the other day. We were talking about different things in the Bible. They said, why don't people believe like they used to? They said, well, they've scienced themselves out right out of belief. Mm -hmm. They've scienced themselves right out of faith. Because it's easier to say, well, I believe this. And, you know, it's in the Bible, but we did some tests and we know that it can happen. What does it matter? Right. <laughs> the Bible says it can happen. The Lord... Or the God of nature is not subject to the laws of nature. Amen. You know, but we've, we've scienced ourselves right out of faith sometimes, haven't we? Amen. They, I was talking to him, and he was saying they, somebody did a test, and they did something with a whale, and they said, well, it turns out there's a 50-50 chance if you just fall by a whale, you can last for three days. I said, well, if the Lord wants you to belly the whale, and the Lord wants you to go somewhere else after that, there's a 100% chance you're going to survive. Amen. The belly of the whale for three days. But are we willing to be used of the Lord? Uh, five, <coughs> chapter 6, if you will. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6, and verse 8. And also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, I am I. Send me. Amen. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Mm. The Bible, what's, you, if, you're not, if you're not paying attention... <laughs> And you're wanting to twist scriptures, you can see that you say, see, this is the Lord. The Lord doesn't want people to be saved. The Lord is closing their eyes. The Lord is doing this and the Lord is doing that. But that's not what this is saying. People, just like he says in John, people love the darkness rather than the light. And when you come into the room with a flashlight, they're going to close their eyes. They're going to close their ears. They don't want to hear what you're preaching. They don't want to hear what you're saying because then they're wrong. Because a carnal mind is an enmity with God, isn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. And so when you come through with the gospel, people don't go, oh, yeah, let me have some more of that. Of their own free will, no one ever does that. Do they? What they say is, oh, that Jesus guy, they want to play him down. He's just a, he's just a good guy. Jesus, he's a historical figure. We can prove that he existed. But we can't prove that he healed the blind, so that's, that's not true. But no, it says... Go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but you understand not. And see ye indeed, but you perceive not. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did with Jesus, didn't they? They heard him, and they didn't understand. And they saw him, but they didn't perceive. They didn't understand what they were seeing. Make the heart of this people fat, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and convert and be healed. Why don't people want to listen because they don't want to? Because then they're going to be sinners, and nobody wants to be the bad guy of the story, do they? Mm -hmm. And when you understand that you're, you're the bad guy, so to speak, that you're the one, you're the reason that Jesus died on the cross, that's a good place to be. Isn't it? Amen. That's what the Lord can give in there today. The Lord can save you because the Lord has made you understand. The Lord has opened your eyes and ears. Because people on their own, they don't want that. You know, what is it when you, you absent or uh, it, just because you don't know what the law is, then it's not a good excuse to, to break the law, right? 
the people they don't want to know because if you don't know it can't be held against them right that's how people think it is mm -hmm. but that's not how it is in our court system and it's not how it is in the bible either for if you do by nature the things in the law you're held to the standard of the law and all that to say this are we standing in the gap are we out there with our flashlight sharing the light of the gospel mm. are we out there making the people have to turn away because that's what they're doing here if you're out there and you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they say hey I don't want that but Jesus told the disciples if that happens you shake the dust off your feet and you go on to the next person there you go because that person's rejected me don't waste your time with that person does that mean that person can never be saved absolutely not does that mean that someone else down the road is going to come to them when they finally hit rock bottom? And they're going to be, man, I wonder what that, that Bryce guy, when he said something about this Jesus, and he said something about this Bible, and then that's when you have your Philip come in. Mm -hmm. And Philip comes in and says, what you read? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you understand what you read? Do you understand what's happening? They say, no, how can I? That's somebody preached to me. Amen. You think that that was the first time that the human had ever had his hands on a Bible when Philip came to him? No. No. I don't know how long that eunuch had had that Bible. I don't know how long that eunuch had been searching. I don't know what happened in that eunuch's life, but I can tell you that that wasn't the first time he heard the gospel. Amen. It was the first time he understood. Amen. But that wouldn't happen if Philip hadn't said, Lord, I'm ready to go. When the Lord told Philip, he said, go, go to the desert. Nobody wants to go to the desert, <laughs> especially in that time. Because they want the car ride. What a 20, 30 minute car ride in an air conditioned car, was it? Philip had to walk. Philip had to run. Philip had to endure the elements the entire way there. And then when Philip got there, he had to sit in an unair conditioned chariot. <laughs> but he got to preach the gospel. And then because of that man's obedience, because he stood in the gap and he made intercession, because Philip was out there preaching, wasn't he? And because of that, that eunuch was saved, and that eunuch went back to Ethiopia to Queen Candace, and that is why in the Eth well, not, not why, but Ethiopia was the first country, and the only, really the only Christian country in all of Africa, still is, mm -hmm. because of one man's obedience. Amen. Yeah. You know, people say, well, one vote won't make a difference. One act of this, one act of obedience won't make a difference. Just, I'm all alone. That's what Elijah said. I'm all alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know when Elijah said that? <laughs> Elijah said that right after he had done two chapters worth of miracles. Elijah said that right after he had been told there was 150 more. Mm -hmm. And Elijah still said, What well, was me? So I'm all alone. And you know what Elijah did? Elijah started comparing himself to everybody else. Right. Lord, I'm not as good as my fathers were. Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Lord, I ain't doing what everyone else is doing. Well, you're not called to do what everyone else is doing. There you go. And you know what? Elijah listened to the Lord after that. Elijah got reinvigorated for the Lord after that. And you know what happened? Elijah did a bunch more chapters worth of stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Elijah was taken off in the chariot of fire, and he threw down his mantle. And the guy that was with him, he did twice as much as Elijah did. Amen. But that never happened if Elijah just said, what was me? I give up. Right. Lord, someone else is going to have to stand in the gap. <laughs> Lord, someone else is going to have to do this because I, I just can't. I'm just not as good as everyone else is. The Lord doesn't call to prepare. He prepares the call. <coughs> Same with Moses. Moses was the biggest stutter that ever was. Moses said, Lord, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Paul was blind. Paul couldn't see well. And Paul, Paul could have said, Lord, I can't do this. How am I supposed to do this? Dear Lord, I can't see. can't see where I'm going. Now, I don't think he was totally blind, but Paul had trouble with his eyes. But the Lord said, don't worry about it. I made you that way. Amen. He told Moses, don't worry about it. I made you that way. And he told Elijah, he said, don't worry about it. Let me show you what it's all about. Amen. And he wasn't in the great swelling things, the Lord wasn't, was he? He wasn't in the great fire. He wasn't in the great uh, wind. He wasn't in the, the rocks. He was in the still, small voice. All right. That's it. Because the Lord doesn't have to be big and bad, does he, <laughs> here on earth? That's what you're here for. Mm -hmm. You're here to carry out what the Lord wants done. If the Lord, God could come down and do it, and it would be fine, and you know what? Probably everyone would still deny it. 
Because you can't see God. God's a spirit. He doesn't have a body. Amen. And you know what? God sent somebody down with a body. And you know what people still say? Oh, just a historical figure, nothing more. Mm. He wasn't the son of God. Just some magician down there from Bethlehem. That's why we're called to stand in the gap. Mm -hmm. That's why we're called to say, Lord, don't come just yet. Lord, I want to work on this person. That old song, the Lord's still working on me to make me who I need to be. Lord, don't, Lord, don't come back just yet. Lord, I, I want to do more. <laughs> not because of the crowns you get to throw at the feet, right? That's not, the, that should, that's not our goal as a Christian. It's the reward of that. But our goal should be to, to be like God and to spread his word. Uh, Go ye into all the nations, teaching and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's standing in the gap. You know what? You know what? I, I, when I was studying this, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but you know what happens right after the, uh, where Jesus said, The harvest truly is plenteous. Pray ye therefore that your master will send laborers into the harvest. You know what the next chapter of the Bible is? That's Jesus sending out the disciples and sending out the apostles. Amen. The next chapter after Jesus says, Pray that your disciple, that your Lord will send harvesters, and send laborers into the harvest. Jesus sent out his laborers into Amen. the harvest. Amen. We're not just called to pray for laborers to come into the harvest. We're not called to pray that people will fill in the gap. We're not called to pray and that be it. We are called to do those things, but that's not the totality of, of our job description, is it? Because in the next verse, it says, go. Mm -hmm. Go. And that is what we're really called to do. Amen. Jesus stood in the gap for us. Get, hmm. Turn with me to John chapter 3. <clears throat> John chapter 3, starting in verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to, be condemned, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because of their deeds. We're evil. Amen. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth that he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and his that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. When you're doing something wrong and you're sinning, whether you're saved or not, you know that it's wrong. And that's why men love darkness. Because mm -hmm. you can hide in the darkness. Right. But when you're out there and you're doing what the Lord says and you're doing your good deeds, and even the world, when they get their one act today, you've all heard that. That's my good thing for the day. <laughs> they don't hide in the darkness. They step out and in the light on that one. They want the spotlight. Look at my good deed for the day. I, I give this guy on the side $5. Not <laughs> just the pocket change I had. Because when your deeds are evil, you want to hide in the light. They're hiding in the darkness, excuse me. But Jesus, it says in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus stood in the gap for us. Amen. Jesus said, God, don't destroy <laughs> those people. Don't just destroy those people. Send me. I'm going to go die for them. And God sent his only begotten Son that he would come down and he would die for us because of his love for us. And I tell you, um, a real, I guess not really, I say realization, that's too big a word for what happened. But just an understanding that I had, and, uh, of course I ain't been preaching too long, but it just seemed like for the first little bit, all I did was, like I just, every time I preached, it was the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. I'm like, man, I don't want to be one of those preachers. <laughs> you know, because that's the thing. You know, all they just talk about the love of God, and everything's going to be all hunky-dory, you know. But i tell you something, if you're preaching the love of God the right way, it ain't all hunky-dory, is it? Right. If you're preaching the love of God the way that it's talked about in the Bible, you can't ever not preach it. If, you, if, you're, if you're looking and you're studying, you can see the gospel and everything. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. 
of Jesus Christ because he loved us. Mm-hmm. And whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is the love of Jesus? What is the love of God? It's a sacrificial love. Mm-hmm. It's agape love. Right. It is the love that says, hey, let me stand in that gap. Let me die so these people don't have to. Mm-hmm. It's the love that says, let me endure the absence of God. So they don't have to. Something we can't even comprehend, can't we? Right. The only thing that we know is the absence of God is what hell is. In the absence of God here in the physical world, what had happened, it went dark. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing. And we can't comprehend that, can we? They just truly can't get our minds wrapped around it because we've never experienced it. We don't have anything to compare it to. But just think about everything in this world and then God not being a part of it. Mm. Honestly, it's so terrible, I don't want to comprehend it. And praise the Lord, I never will have to. Amen. Because when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, the eternal presence of the Lord, where his glory will radiate so much, there won't even be a sun. There won't be any stars. There won't be need for the moon, because there won't be nighttime. Amen. Just the glory of God will light up the whole place. The love of God says, put a nail right there right there. It doesn't matter. It hurts both places. It doesn't matter where they put the nail. People argue about it. Well, I mean, honestly, that means just as little as whether Adam had a belly button or not. It <laughs> doesn't matter one lick about your salvation if they put the nail here, here, or just in his shoulder. doesn't matter one teeny tiny bit. What matters is that that nail went through both his hands. And we say nail, and what this little ten pin nail was it? <laughs> It's a big old railroad spike is what we would call it in it. Right. And he had one in each hand, and he had one driven through both his feet. And every time he wanted to breathe, he'd have to push all his weight up on those open nerves in his feet, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Just to get a little breath of air to keep his physical body. So that he could suffer so that you wouldn't have to. Amen. That's the love of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, if you can preach that without making people cringe, if you can hear that without just going, oh, then I question salvation. Mm-hmm. And I question your humanity because that is pain like we can't understand. Right. That is a love that, that honestly I, we, we can receive, but can we give that kind of love? Are you willing to die so that someone else wouldn't have to? I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying we wouldn't do it. It's not something we want to volunteer for, is it? It's not something you go around looking every day and realize, who can I save today? Who can I jump in front of the gun for? <clears throat> but should we? <laughs> not the physical gun, but what about the spiritual one that the devil's got? Mm-hmm. The wiles of the devil that he's shooting. Are we looking around and going, who can I see in the gap for? Who can I jump in front of with my shield of faith? Mm-hmm. Maybe my brother, he's... He's backslidden a little bit. Maybe maybe he's hurting a little bit. Maybe the devil's been getting on to him. Let me come up and let me help him. And let me stand in the gap for my brother in Christ. Because what does the Bible say? That you are bonds in bonds together. Are we willing to help out each other? Are we willing to stand in the gap for even the people that we know, for even the people that we're in bonds with in the church? Now, I'll tell you something else that uh, just got me, or I brought my attention to it here in John chapter 3, uh, in verse 11 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, excuse me, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. What does the Bible say? It says, We speak that we do know. Mm-hmm. If you don't know it, you can't speak it. The Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance, not all things to your knowledge. If you want to be used, you've got to know what's in the Scripture. You've got to know what's in there. We're going to get to this here in just a second, but in the uh, armor of the Lord, when he gives that to us, what are your feet shod with? Preparation of the gospel. The preparation of the gospel. Not just the gospel of peace. The preparation of that gospel. So let me ask you this question. Are your shoes untied? 
Are they prepared? Because the shoes themselves, the gospel, hasn't done anyone any good all by itself, has it? How many Bibles in America right now have sat on the shelf for more than a year? Right. Collecting dust, doing nothing. The devil's not afraid of a clothes Bible. We've all heard that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. The devil's scared of a prepared Bible. Mm -hmm. A gospel that's prepared. A gospel that's locked, loaded, and ready to go. Jesus was prepared and the devil came, wasn't he? Jesus, every time the devil came to him, had scripture to come back with. Do we? Right. When the devil comes, do we have to say, hold on just one minute. <laughs> Let me go see what the Bible says. Or do we know, hey, just like the Hebrew children, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Jesus was not careful. Jesus didn't have to hesitate. They didn't have to say, well, I think the law says this. I tell you, Balaam, he wasn't ready. Balaam could have stood in the gap. Balaam could have said, I will not curse the Lord's people. But Balaam said, hold on just a minute. Let me go see if that's what the Lord wants me to do. Let me go see if the Lord wants me to curse his children. <laughs> and the Lord said, no. Right. And Balaam went back and he said, well, I can't come out and play today. <laughs> and so the princes went back and the king said, all right, I have another idea. Let me send the bigger princes, the people with longer titles, the people with bigger crowns. And they came up to him and Balaam said, well, hold up. Let me go see. And Balaam went and prayed, and the Lord said, No. I tell you what, if they come to you again, you can go. And Balaam said, All right, boys, I'm ready to play. Let's go out and play. And Balaam disobeyed the Lord. Right. And Balaam went and he went to curse the children, but he didn't. Because <laughs> the Lord wouldn't let him. Right. You know, I really I haven't fully got my mind wrapped around Balaam and, and, and what happened there. Because it just seems like to me you should just know. Don't curse the Lord's children. Don't curse his people. But Balaam had a purpose, didn't he? Balaam shows us what we ought to do and that is obey the Lord. Balaam could have stood in the gap and said, I will not. Matter of fact, the Lord curse you for even wanting that to happen. But that's not what Balaam said. Balaam said, I sure could use that money. Mm. Balaam said, I sure could use a new wardrobe. I sure could use the horses that they brought, the camels, whatever they were offering. Balaam, Balaam said, I think about all I can do for the Lord for that. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what Saul did. And when he went, he was told to destroy all the people. And Saul said, well, I can use the sheep. We can sacrifice the sheep. No, I can keep my sheep. The Lord wants obedience. And the Lord wants us to stand in the gap. And the Lord wants us to do what he says when he says it. If the Lord wanted you to do what you wanted to do, he wouldn't worry about it. <coughs> if, if, you, if we could take care of ourselves, and if we could take care of what we need to take care of, the Lord wouldn't have come. Mm -hmm. But we can't, because the carnal mind is an enemy of God. And we would not love him except that he loved us. And so that God sent his only begotten son into this world to stand in the gap. And we're called to be like him, aren't we? Be ye holy as I am holy. Are we holy enough to stand in the gap? Can we be used? I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to come back to that point here in a little bit. So how is it that we are to be used of the Lord? Quite simply, just by doing your part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like a government speech, doesn't it? If everyone just pitches in and does your part. <laughs> but if we will, for the Lord, do what we're called to do, we can stand in the gap. Mm -hmm. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I think this is where I read the last time I was here, so I'm going to bring it back to your remembrance, I guess. The first Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Not concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, and that no man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. No man that calls Jesus accursed is of God. 
And we've got people that call Jesus a curse, don't we? Mm -hmm. We've got people who are supposedly supposed to be standing in the gap calling Jesus a curse. Yeah. But I tell you what, they may be standing in the gap, but it's with a pair of hedge trimmers. Mm. And they're shaving away and they're trying to make that hole bigger. Because it's easier to attack somebody if the hole's bigger, isn't it? Doing our part, First Corinthians, there, verse 27. It says, Now you are members of the body of Christ and members in particular. And you're put here for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. And your purpose is to stand in that gap. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is to stand in that gap and say, Lord, be with the pastor this week. Lord, give him the message I need to hear. Lord, be with the brother. He's not feeling well. Lord, be with the sister. She's been under a lot of stress recently. Lord, I ask for your help. Lord, be with these people. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, if everyone was standing in the gap, you wouldn't have any problems, would it? Because the hedge would be made up. All right. I'm not saying everyone here is not standing in the gap. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if we all stood in the gap, it would be a lot better, wouldn't it? Mm hmm if we put into the church as much as we want to take out of it, if, if we sowed, what does the Bible say? Well, with what measure you need, show measure to you again. So how often are we judged? And I, I, was, I did a message a while back about uh, the seed and the sower, or the sower and the seed. And he sowed. And you know what the sower didn't do? He didn't go around and check every seed after it was done to make sure it was good. And the Bible says in that the seed is the gospel. The seed is the word. We're not called to go check up on people. We're called to share the gospel what the Lord has told us to do. And if we sow what we need to sow, the Lord will take care of the rest. Won't Amen. We? The Lord gives the increase, not us. Not our responsibility. Because if you're too busy going around checking all the seeds you've planted and you're trying to make sure that trying to make sure that you get your numbers up, <laughs> you know, you get that extra crown because you got that extra person, you're not standing in the gap, are you? Right. If you're too busy worrying about your own self, you can't be standing in the gap for everyone else. And brings brings up a good good question. Are you in a place in your Christian walk where you don't have to worry about yourself anymore? You've got your routine and you know, hey, I'm in the Word and I know and I know that the Lord will take care of me. So, Lord, let me help this brother out. Let me help this sister out. Dear Lord, I'm good. Dear Lord, you've been working on me and I'm not perfect. Dear Lord, never will be. But, dear Lord, I'm confident enough to know that I can do all things through you. Lord, I know that you love me and you're going to take care of me. And I read the back of the book and I know that everything works out just fine. Amen. Lord, I'm ready to stay in the gap. I'm ready to be used. Because I'm good. Now, not to say that we call no man good, right? But are we confident enough in ourselves? Are we confident enough in God, in our walk with the Lord, that we can let ourselves stand in the gap? Mm -hmm. I am not a runner. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so I would not go to a track team and say, all right, I'm the new coach. This is what we're going to be doing. Because I don't know. I'm not sure in that. And the same thing with standing in the gap. If you're not ready, if you're not well-versed, and you don't have your feet shot with the preparation <coughs> of the gospel, you're not going to do any good in the gap. Because you're going to be too busy worrying about yourself trying to dodge the devil's wiles and the darts that he's throwing at you with your shield. We're called to do our part, not everyone else's, just like Elijah. Elijah got worried that he wasn't doing what his fathers were doing. He got worried he wasn't doing what the other judges were doing. Oh, that's not, that's not what we're called to do. Now, this isn't the Bible, but I ran across this little poem. It's by Dr. Seuss, but don't hurt me. <laughs> but it says, today you are you. This is truer than true. There is no one alive who is you -er than you. Now, that's a fun way to say you're your own person. You are your own individual. And that's how the Lord deals with you in it. And that is how the Lord gives you what you need to do as an individual. There is not a single person in the world 
who knows whether you're saved, truly. And there's not a single person in the world who knows what the Lord has done for you. Well, they can see what the Lord's done for you, but they don't know what the Lord's called you to, is what I meant to say. You're the only one. Because your relationship with the Lord is between me and him. But it shouldn't stay like that, should it? You shouldn't be an island, and that's not what we're called to be. You should have fruits meet for repentance, right? Mm -hmm. Other people should have to look at you and they say, man, that Carlin fella, that Carlin fella, man, I, I can't tell you, I, I can't, I don't know how many times I've stayed the night, I don't have balls, but there hasn't been a single time where I didn't wake up, have balls in there with a cup of coffee in the Bible. Don't know how long you've been up. I assume it's been bitter earlier than when I got up. But I can tell you that that Carlin fellow, he's a Christian. And there's something different about that Carlin fellow. Can we say the same thing about us? Can we say, hey, there's something different about that, that Larry fellow? About those Anderson people? There's something different about these people. They don't cuss, they don't go out, they don't party. There's something different about those people. Are these, are, can people know that you're standing in the gap? Because we don't all walk around with the little yellow star. We don't all walk around with the fish symbol tattooed on us, do we? <laughs> people got to know this by your actions. People should Amen. know this by your actions. Because standing in the gap, it's not, you're not just standing there holding your shield. <laughs> No, you're at war. You're on guard. You've got that martial stance for the Lord, don't you? You've got your shield and you've got your sword. And you're ready. Because the Bible says what? That the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. It says they will prevail, not they will attack. And I think we've forgotten that. The devil said, oh, why can't we? And don't worry about it. But the devil, he's right there with me. He's got his instruments of war, and he's got his devils, and he's got his demons. And he's got those fallen angels, and they're around, and they're going to be attacking the church in any and every way that they can. Mm -hmm. Hey, I believe pretty much everything you do. I mean, the church went out of existence there for a little bit, but that's, that's no <laughs> big deal. Don't worry about it. Hey, I believe everything that you do, but baptism, that's that's where the real power comes from. That Jesus guy, he that way. Just, I mean, you know, it's a baptism. If baptism was all that was required, Jesus would have came down, been baptized, and went back. He'd have done what he had to do. He'd have set the standard for us, and he'd have left. Which is why else would he die? Right. Yeah. If baptism was it, what's the purpose? If saying a little prayer was worth it, then why even go get wet? Baptism is a symbolic nature, as the brother said, in, in our profession of an inward possession. Mm -hmm. Baptism, standing in the gap. Because the Lord can't use you, and the Lord won't use you if you're not willing to say, I'm the Lord's. Because mm -hmm. that's what baptism is. And the baptism is saying, I'm the Lord's. Right. <clears throat> I've symbolically died to sin and risen again for the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm the Lord's. Whenever you're playing on a sports team, they give you a jersey, bright colors, so everybody knows which team you're on. You don't get hired in with a $10 million contract and then don't wear your team colors, do you? I just don't want anybody to know. <laughs> Are we the same with the Lord, though? I'm saved. Don't tell anybody. I don't want to get baptized. And people might think something. I don't want to get baptized. The Lord might use me. Mm -hmm. One might sit in one of those places where they don't have toilets inside. <laughs> Are we willing to stand in the gap? Are we willing to say, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, use me. Where's the gap, Lord? Is it over there where those toilets are outside? <laughs> right. Where they don't have all the, the best water in the world? Or is it right there where I was born my whole life? 
Lord, is that where the gap is? Are we willing to be used of the Lord? First Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. Do we pray? <laughs> One, do we pray? Hmm. Two, do we pray enough? Right. Or can we say, I pray without ceasing? Do we live in a life of prayer? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. In verse 14 it says, and when, they, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and sore vexed, for oft times he faileth, and he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithful to the first generation, how long shall I suffer you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then Jesus came, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as great as mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer. And fast you. Mm -hmm. There's two things here. Three things. <laughs> One, sometimes there is an easy solution. Sometimes this is an easy solution to the problem. Sometimes it takes leather work, as they say. Sometimes it just takes you getting down in the ditch and digging it. Sometimes there's not always an easy way out. And two, it says if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. I'm sure most of us here by this point in our life have seen at least a picture of what a mustard seed looks like. I mean, a little tiny thing. Used to see them, you know, they have little jars of them that are this big and there'd be 10 or 12 of them. I mean, just, just little bitty things. And that's the amount of faith that you need to move them out. Hmm. And I tell you something, when you turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and you talk about the, 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 the faith wall of fame, not a single person in there ever moved them out. Hmm. And yet those are the people that are in the Bible saying they had such great faith. And not a single one of them ever moved them out. Greater must side of mustard seed ain't nothing. And half of that is so much more than any of us have, isn't it? You're right. Do we have faith? And you know why faith is important? Because that's what your shield is. Faith is the shield. It's the shield that protects you from the wire, fiery darts of the devil. If you have enough faith that the devil can't touch you, you have enough faith the Lord will take care of you, and you have the faith to say, I can do all things, and Christ strengthens me. If God be for us, who can be against us? If you have that kind of faith, the devil can't get to you, can he? Amen. Because your shield will protect you, because your shield's out here. And that'll be what protects you. Then your breastplate of righteousness won't be touched. The devil won't be able to turn your good works against you. You know what the third thing here is? <laughs> Jesus said in verse 21, This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You know what that tells me? I believe Jesus had been praying and fasting before that happened. Hadn't right. You don't talk about fasting nearly enough. <laughs> You're right. I, I really, I've only ever done it once, and it wasn't but for just a little bit of time. And I say that not to go for a good job, brother. I'm saying that to my detriment. I've only ever done it once. You know, on the last Wednesday, people say I was talking about the, the ordination of the church, the ordination of the, of the pastors and the different offices in the church. Every time they did it, you know what they did it with? Prayer. Fast and you're right. And they, and they put their hands on when they Amen. Sing. Do we pray and do we fast? Now, I'm not going to leave fast alone for right now. I'm going to talk about prayer. Are we praying enough so when something happens and we've got to be in a prayerful state that we're prepared? Or when the devil comes, we have to say, Hold on. I'm not ready for this right now. Because <clears throat> you know the devil don't care. 
Mm -hmm. All right. That's when the devil wants to attack you. You don't. That's why <laughs> we crossed the Delaware on Christmas in the Revolutionary War because they weren't prepared. And when we got there, they didn't say time out, and we let them get ready. This is spiritual warfare, and we've we've let the warfare part kind of drift away. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But it is warfare. The devil, his people hadn't forgotten. They've just got some really good marketers on the payroll. They've got some really good spies on the payroll. I, 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 I mean, it ain't war. I mean, when's the last time you ever killed a demon with a sword? That's crazy talk. That's just that old Bible talk. That doesn't mean what it means. <laughs> That's what the devil wants you to think, and you're right. But we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Amen. It's spiritual warfare. And we've been given spiritual weapons, haven't we? Mm -hmm. We've been given the spiritual weapons, we've been given the spiritual armor, we've been given the spiritual go-ahead to go and attack. But we're too scared to stand in the gap. Because mm -hmm. my armor might get dirty. Mm. I might be used. I might get sent to the front lines for the Lord. Are we willing to stand in the gap? Matthew chapter 21, if you flip over with me there while we're here. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 19 it says, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth word forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? The disciples. But they were with Jesus. And they knew Jesus and they'd seen the miracles of Jesus. And yet when Jesus said, fig tree go wither away, they said, oh, he withered away. <laughs> the people that walked with Jesus didn't have the faith that they needed, did they? Right. And they were with Jesus. They were with the very man, the son of God, and they still said, well, this ain't going to happen. And if those people had a trial of faith, why do you think you won't have a trial of faith being 2,000 years removed from that? Right. In verse 21, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Don't doubt the Amen. Lord. Amen. You know why you don't want to stand in the gap? Because you doubt the Lord. You know why you don't want to stand in the gap? Because you don't believe the Lord can take care of you there. Mm. You don't believe that the devil can be stopped. You don't believe that it matters. You don't believe in the Lord and what he can do. It says, all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believe and you shall receive. Do we believe what we pray? Mm. We just go through the motions. Right. Do you know why you pray over your food? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the Bible says about that? Because mm -hmm. you give thanks for it. That's why you pray over your food. Give thanks is a more accurate term for it, I think, than you pray over your food. Unless you're worried about being poisoned, maybe, but we're to give thanks for our food. If it here it says we're to ask in prayer, believing, and you shall receive it. Do we believe in the Lord so much? Do we have faith in the Lord? Lord, I know that no matter what I ask you to be done, even something crazy as the tree died and it went on. Mountain move and it'll be moved. Do we have why don't we have that faith? Why don't why, why do we doubt the Lord? The Lord can't move that now. Talk about the same Lord that had the whole world full of water. Amen. The Lord that made it rain. Such a commonplace thing to us, especially after yesterday. But it never happened before. We're talking about the Lord that made an axe head float on the water. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, the cheap plastic stuff that we got now. We, right. It was a real deal on our stuff. Mm -hmm. And that floated on the water. It is the same Lord that said 
Take my manna cake first, and you won't have to worry about it again. And the widow woman, what did she do? She had faith. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're a man of God. <laughs> I'm doing it. And she baked the man of God a cake, and her little cruise of oil never ran out, and her little handful of flour Amen. never stopped. Don't tell her how many cakes that woman made. That's right. All because she said, I'm going to die. But here you go, Lord. Think that was more than 10%? <laughs> there you go. You think that two sticks and that oil and that that, that, that flour, that mill, you think that was more than the 10% that that lady had? And she didn't question it. She just said, here's man of God. Here you go. Here's the water, the glass of water, go with it. It's all I got. And I don't know, but I can imagine just being human. That widow woman stood there with her son right there in her, in her apron, as we would say, and watched the man of God eating it, drooling the whole time. No telling when the last time they ate was, because their plan was to eat this and then die. Mm -hmm. Then Elijah said, maybe another. I went there she could. Then she made one for her, then she made one for her son. And then three years later, she was still making them. That's it. All because a lady had faith. And you know what that lady never did? Move them out. Right. But you know what she did? She made cakes for three years in famine. Right. We don't have to move mountains. I'm not saying that no one in Scripture could ever move mountains. But the Lord never told them to. But I'll tell you what he did do. He said, hey, Moses, go hit that rock over there. I'm going to make some water come out of it. And it happened. I said this the other day, but I think we've taken the humanity out of the Bible. Hmm. The devil has taken the humanity out of the Bible. He said, well, those weren't humans. Those are the heroes of the faith. Those characters over there, they can do it. But you can't. Hmm. Let me tell you something. These people were people just like me and you. Right. That widow woman, she had just as much love for her child as you do for yours. Mm -hmm. She had just as much hunger pains, more than I would say any of us have ever had. And I bet she had more faith than any of us have. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't eaten in a couple, couple weeks and you finally had found the cupboards a little bit to make a little bit of bread, and then your pastor came and said, well, make it for me first. Oh, you probably wouldn't say okay, would you? You say, get out of here. Mm. You say, get out of here. My son had me. You take care of you. We've taken the humanity out of the Bible. And because of that, we don't, we aren't the ones that's supposed to stand in the gap. It's the heroes of the faith over here that are supposed to do it. It's those Peters and those Paul, Paul, Paul. I think of everything that Paul went through, I never could. There's a song I like. It's called Start Right Here. I forget who sings it. But um, it says, We want our. So we want to see revival. I'm going to paraphrase here. It says, We want to see revival. We want to see the world, Lord work great and mighty. But when we even walk across the street to share the word of God. Mm. So we want to keep our missions overseas. Because that's what the heathens are, isn't it? But we need to preach in just as much as the next person, don't we? Mm -hmm. More so. <laughs> you know why see, it seems so easy when you go overseas and you start a mission? And everyone goes, I believe, I believe, I believe. Because those people have never seen it before. And they said, that's the power of God. And we've grown up with it. Your whole life you've had somebody up here in a suit and tie preaching you, telling you how good God is and all this and that and the other thing for God. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, I know it. But do we believe it? Hey, Amen. Those people over there, they didn't know it. <clears throat> but when they knew it, they believed it. But for us, church, is just what you do twice a week, two or three times a week, isn't it? Because we don't have faith that God can do something with it.
because we aren't willing to stand in the gap and get recharged on Sunday. Because we're not willing to be recharged on Wednesday night. It's just something you got to tick off for the Lord. And if that's why you're doing it, you know better than the Amish. There you go. Just doing it for the sake of works. This is one of those good works the Lord said I was ordained to. It'd be nice to go to sleep early, though. <laughs> be nice to sleep in on one of the few days I had to do nothing. We like that one. The Bible says don't do anything on Sunday, and we jump all on board on that one, didn't we? <laughs> we have faith in the easy things, but do we have faith in the hard things? Are we willing to stand in the gap? Will you be ready when the battle comes? The battle's coming. Turn with me back to Ezekiel, but this time in chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, that prophesy and say, that prophesy and say thou unto them, that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the desert. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. How does this world end? A great big battle. Mm -hmm. What do we end right now, spiritually? A great big battle. Amen. And if you're not making up the hedge, you're not going to win in the day of battle. I think of it kind of like this. The Romans had a had a formation. They had a bunch of guys that would go up, they'd stand up with their shields, side by side by side. Nobody was getting through. Then they had other guys that would come over top of them and they put shields over top of them where the arrows couldn't get in. The phalanx, I think is what it was called. And they would just charge. They would just plod right in the middle of everybody because you couldn't do anything to them. They were just all covered up with shields. And the Lord will protect you in that way if we're standing in the gap. Mm -hmm. But if one person has their shield and they were a little late to church this morning, like me, <laughs> and they weren't there when, when the formation was gathered, you're going to have a gap, aren't you? And the arrows are going to get in, and the devil's going to throw a fiery dart in there, and now he's affecting all your brothers and sisters because we didn't stand in the gap and we didn't do our part. In the day of battle, are we not only willing to be used, but can we be used? And we've been referencing it the whole time, so go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now there's another sermon all by itself. <laughs> Have we done all to stand? <laughs> or did we just get a little sprain, sprain a, a wrist or elbow or ankle or something? So I'm done. The Lord can't use me now. I'm finished. Oh, Lord, just, I, I can't. Just take me out now, like Elijah said. Lord, I just can't be as good as everyone else. Just take me away. Have we done all to stand? And we said, Lord, I'm not doing what everyone else is doing, but Lord, you use me as best as you can. Lord, I want to be used as much as I possibly can. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, praying always. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting? <laughs> salvation, the word of God, and prayer are all in the same thought. Because how does verse 17 end with a colon? Not a period. This isn't the next part. This isn't the second part. This isn't separate in the Word of God. This is part of it. Mm -hmm. Can I be so bold as to say that prayer and supplication is the leather bits that held your armor together? Because when you're putting on armor, it's, you know, it hinges and all that good stuff. But back in those days, it was fastened together with leather over the shoulders and around the side. And everywhere that it needed to move and have a joint, it would be held together with leather. Can I be so bold to say praying always with all prayer, supplication, and the Spirit is the leather that holds it together? Because if you're not praying, then you're not doing your good works, are you? Because you don't know what the Lord's ordained you to do, and your breastplate of righteousness will fall right off, won't it? If you're not praying and you're not making supplication, you're not standing in the gap, then you're not using your sword, are you? Because you don't know where to, where to use it. Because you're not praying. The Lord's not talking to you. You're not talking to the Lord. Prayer and supplication is part of the armor of God. And we forgot to teach that part because the devil said it don't matter. He doesn't fit in with all the Sunday school material. Because prayer and supplication doesn't have a cool thing that we can pin up on the on the board. Ezekiel says, there's a battle coming. And God said, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. Are you willing to be used of the Lord to stand in the gap? Because Jesus stood in the gap, didn't he? Amen. In John chapter 13, Jesus got down and he washed his, his apostles' feet. In servitude, he says, and you do likewise. Wash each other's feet. You need to get down and you need to serve those around you. It's not an ordinance in the Bible. I just can't see that. But we're called to symbolically get down and wash and serve each other. And you know what John, in John chapter 13, you know what it says? It says, you call me master and Lord, and for good reason, for I am. You ever had a time whenever Jesus was in the world? You know what he said whenever someone says, Oh, Master, oh, Rabbi, why do you call me that? Jesus, are you calling it to me because you believe in me? Or are you just saying that because it's what the world would call me? But Jesus, to his church, he knew they believed. And he said, You call me so well, for I am your Lord and I am your Master. And if I am willing to get down and serve you, how come you, my servants, aren't, won't do it? He said, you are the servants. And I'm your master, and I'm doing this menial task. And in case something else, our Lord and our Savior and our master, he came and he stood in the gap. And how come we as the servants aren't willing to do what the master did? The master's supposed to just sit up there with his feet propped up, Right? Go do this. Go do that. That's the master's job. But the master didn't do that. The master came and the master died on the cross for our sins. Amen. The master came and suffered so we wouldn't have to. And all he asked in return is that you go and you stand in the gap. You don't have to endure the absence of God. You don't have to have spikes nailed through you. You don't have to be beat with a cat of nine tails. <coughs> The Canada Hills was so vicious and so terrible, most people never made it past that stage. You're right. And those that did had their backs so flayed open and torn, there are accounts of people's organs just falling out and falling off the back. Because mm -hmm. there's nothing to hold them in anymore. Well, that makes you cringe, doesn't it? And after that, Jesus had his back wide open, all the nerve endings exposed, got shoved up against the hardwood cross. Mm -hmm. And in all the pictures, it's a tree in four before, isn't it? Looks nice and smooth. 
perfectly hewn by the master carpenter, but no. I would be willing to bet that rough wooden cross was just what it was, a rough wooden cross. Mm -hmm. I bet they didn't spend the money to have the biggest and best carpenter come and shave all the splinters off of the cross. I bet they didn't hire the biggest and the best to put it together. I bet it was roughly hewn. There at church, we are doing some renovations on the church, and we took out and we see some of the beams in, in between the... Uh, in the basement, you know, where the, it's holding the church up, and those are hand hewn, and it's jagged, and it's rough, and it's it's not real pretty. And I wouldn't dare for a hundred dollars run my finger up against it, because sure enough, I'd come up with a splinter. And yet Jesus said on the cross every time He raised and lowered those exposed nerve endings, His flesh opened to the wounds. Is rubbing up and down on that cross, mm -hmm. adding to the agony. And on top of that, while he's up there, he's naked and ashamed. And he's got a big plaque above his head, making fun of him. Mm. And that's, that didn't even matter. Jesus did it. Would it matter what they put above your head if you're sitting up there struggling to breathe? But they did it anyway. Salt tinge. And that's the love of Jesus. And that's the gap that Jesus stood in for you. Mm -hmm. And all you got to do is stand in the gap and say, Lord, don't come back just yet. Lord, I want to be used by you. Lord, go and send me. Lord, here am I. Send me. But we don't say that, do we? Why aren't we saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. What would have happened if Jesus had said, pass? Lord, I'm not willing to go. It's too hard. Lord, I just don't want to today. For God. But he didn't. So why do we, if the master said, I'm willing to go, how come we, the servants, get a choice in what we do? How come we, the servants of the Lord, can tell our master no whenever he says to go and he says to do? When the Lord was here... <coughs> And the Lord was standing in the gap. You know what the Lord could have done at any time? He said, dash his foot against the stone and he'd have been out of here. Mm -hmm. So God and Jesus, the entire time that he was here, had a free ticket home. One way. And what is it we do whenever we're helping out a friend and we're helping them clean out the garage? I don't have to be here. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm just doing this out of the goodness of my heart. The whole time we're there, picking up those heavy spider-infested boxes, what are we doing? We're thinking about how we need to go. How about a good excuse to leave? In Jesus, who was robed in flesh, just like me and you, the whole time he was here, man, I could just go. Man, I, I could just leave. I don't have to be here. I don't have to walk on these dusty roads. Man, my castle burned up. Will I have to walk another 13 miles to the next city? Man, I don't want to be here. Man, I don't got a bed to sleep on. I got a pillow to lay my head on. I ain't got no money. I just need to go. But Jesus said, if I do, you can't be saved. That's right. Because a carnal mind's an enmity with God. And we, even, if, you know, when we're born, your only hope is to never sin from the time you're born to the time you die. And keep the law in the middle at that time. And Jesus said, I know you can't do it. Because I've seen one of you has done it in the last thousands of years. And Jesus said, I can go. I just, I can go. You know how, or, or the reason I think Jesus knew that he could go? Because he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Lord, please let this cup pass from me. Prayed it three times. And finally he got peace and he said, Lord, I'm ready. Send me. Lord, here am I. Your God, here am I. God, I'm ready to go. God, give me the cup. I feel it extra full. I'm ready to stand in the gap. God, I'm ready to stand for these people. So they don't have to endure hell. So they don't have to endure the absence of God. God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. Send me. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus was nailed to that rough wooden cross and went through all the punishment and ridicule. Stand in the gap. You bet. You know, and I, I, I tell you this. You know what the last three things in the Bible? The last three things said in the Bible at the end of Revelation. It says, 
I'm coming back quickly. And until I do, don't add anything to the Word of God and don't take anything away. Mm -hmm. Those are the last three things, the most important things. At the very end that the God, God told his people right now. Jesus says in red letters, I'm coming back quickly. Praise the Lord. Amen. He's coming back quickly. And if we're standing in the gap and he said, Lord, don't come back that quickly. I've still got family. I've still got friends. I've still got co-workers. I've got people I know. I've got people I don't know I want to see saved, Lord. Don't come back just now. Give me just a little more time. Lord, make intercession. I'll make an intercession for your people. Don't come back. Don't destroy these people. Don't pour out your indignation upon these people just yet. Lord, there's still more. Lord, I want to be used. Lord, I'm ready. And the word of God is so important. The last two things are don't add, don't take away from it. And what have we seen in the last 50, 100 years? People have added and people have taken away. Because the devil knows how important this Bible is. Book is just not a reverend enough word for it, is it? The devil knows the power. The devil knows where your sword is, and the devil has taken away from it, and he's added to it, and he's made your sword dull. Yeah. And he's loosened your shoestrings, and you're not prepared with the gospel. And then if your shoestrings aren't tight, sometimes he's got you prepared with the wrong Bible. Mm. Prepared with the gospel. And the devil's made us unfit and unready to stand in the gap at Why are we letting the devil win? You know who's in charge of your life? You and God. The devil's coming. He's trying to edge in there and make you turn. But it's God. Pray to God and seek him. Amen. And next time the Lord talks to you, I'm going to tell you what Elias said. Say, speak for thy servant here. Amen. Amen.